Hello again, my name is Ha, and welcome to part two of the tutorial for beginners uh, for the Tides of Crimson mod. Tides of Crimson is a full conversion fantasy mod for Civilization 3. All right, so last time we left off, uh, we just built a new city and we were working on uh, getting a, a worker unit here so we can improve some of the land around here. One thing I didn't touch up on last time that I kind of wanted to touch on this time was uh, how units affect happiness in a city. So let's double click on the city to get into it. And you'll notice here that the grunt, which is a military unit, right? So he has uh, at least one defense. Um, he's a military unit. And anytime there's a military unit, uh, well, most of the time, you'll get this happy face here, right? So that, that pretty much or more of a content face, I guess. But what this means is that this the presence of this unit, which is called the military police, uh, will make one of your unhappy citizens content, right? So someone who's rebelling, for example, will actually become content. So uh, depending on your difficulty level, uh, our difficulty level is regent, right? So that means that our first three uh, citizens will be content, are born content, if you will. So one two three so these are automatically going to be content for us when that fourth citizen comes right so we we grow enough so we get you know in, food in the box here so we have four citizens that citizen's automatically going to be unhappy okay it's going to start off unhappy and at that point we're going to have an imbalance right because we'll have uh unhappiness in our city and uh, we won't have another happy citizen to kind of balance that out. So, uh, but what this military police does is because of this little content face here, he actually will make one unhappy citizen content. So when that we get that fourth citizen, when the city grows, this the presence of this military police here will actually keep that citizen content and keep the, the city from um, going into civil unrest. Okay, so uh, depending on your sphere, uh, sphere is kind of like a government type uh, in, in Tides of Crimson. So depending on your sphere, you'll, ha you'll have like a different military police limit. I believe right now with no sphere, our police, a military police limit is two. So the first two grunts or mili any military unit really um, here will help, uh, you know, turn an unhappy citizen into a content citizen. Uh, the third one in here, if we have a third uh, unit, will have no effect under our current sphere, right? So if you want to learn more about spheres, you can just go into the Civilopedia here. You can click on spheres. And right now we start the game, everybody starts the game really at no sphere, right? Because we don't have a sphere yet. And you can see right here, military police limit is two. So that's what that means, okay? There's other attributes in here and, and we can go into that later. Um, or you could kind of explore on your own, but uh, just right now, military police limit too, and that's how we would know. All right. So you'll see here, this looks like a, an enemy unit. Well, technically uh, not, you know, we're not at war with anyone, but uh, definitely not our units. Uh, you can tell by the, the different color highlight here, um, but you can right click, right? And, um, you can see that it's a troll way watcher okay everybody starts the game with one way watcher and, and obviously we lost ours in uh, a tragic incident but uh the trolls still have theirs so it looks like this troll here uh unit is still rolling around uh, it's probably exploring um you'll find that the ai kind of walks through your territory and you can yell at them to not do so but um it's not automatic uh, but when you go into the AI territory, right? They'll yell at you. So um, not really fair, but you, I mean, you still get a chance to yell at them. Um, but there's times when they can just walk right through if you don't say anything. And I'm guessing this guy's just gonna probably walk right through our territory here. Yep, that's what I thought. What a jerk. All right. And he's gone. Wonder what he was looking for. You know, probably some berries or something like that. Didn't find any. Okay, so here's a different looking unit. So again, 
I'm just right clicking here anytime I see something like that. This is the Dark Elves, okay, and this is an aggro. And if I don't know what an aggro is, right, I can just click on this and it'll describe that to me, right? So uh, this unit can summon a colonizer, right? Um, so summoning, um, this was mentioned before, but units that can summon uh, actually have, and if you click on it here, it describes it for you, actually have a one-third chance of creating another unit when they are victorious in battle, right? So there's a one in three chance that if this unit wins a battle, this colonizer will be produced, right? And summoned units are free, meaning they don't cost any maintenance to uh, kind of, uh, you know, sustain uh, their services. So they're really valuable. And maintenance and things like that, we'll, we'll go through that in a bit. So if you don't, you don't want, you don't know what that is, don't worry yet. All right. Okay. On the next turn here, uh, looks like Malagrath is offering me he's from the Dark Elves, he's offering me mining for 110 gold. But remember, this is not uh, the optimal deal for us. So uh, remember that trick that we learned earlier, uh, we can actually take this off here and go to lump sum and see how that the mod here will automatically uh, route this to 103 gold. So this is the lowest offer that Melagrath will actually accept. So and I'll prove it to you here. So let's say we do 102 instead, right? Just give him 102 for the mining tech. He's going to deny us, right? It's 103 is the lowest token. Okay, so just do that. It automatically um, does it for you. Thank you again, Flintlock, for the mod uh, that does that. And we're going to just go ahead and accept this, uh, see if he's accepting this deal. And he will, of course. Um, all right, so we have nothing else really to say to him. We could go in here and, and again, hit we propose another deal, uh, cycle through some other uh, civilizations to trade with, but there's not really much that I want to trade right now. You can actually trade things like cities, um, which actually I've never really done because I'm kind of scared to give away a city. I don't know. I don't know about you, but if, if you've ever... If you've ever been a king, uh, a lord of any empire, I, I don't know, just the thought of giving away cities, right? Even if it's a virtual city, it's, I don't like that feeling too much. But um, you'll see here, Malagrath has actually a lot of technologies that he can uh, trade to us, but we don't really have much we can trade back. And as you see down here, we only have a, a little bit of gold. I think it's uh, 37 gold. So not much we can really do here. Um, we're going to go ahead and exit. Okay, this guy's just running around. Probably scouting for uh, a good place to uh, build a city as well. All right, so this is exciting. Uh, this is our first worker unit. For the orcs, it's the peon. And uh, the unit actions for uh, the peon are all down here, right? Um, one thing I would recommend doing is turning on the advanced unit uh, action buttons. Uh, mostly because uh, worker units can do quite a lot, actually. So you definitely want to see everything that they're capable of doing. In order to do that, uh, you just go to the main menu over here, right? You can go to Preferences. And you're going to click on this little thing here. It says Show Advanced Unit Action Buttons. Okay? And you'll notice that now our peon has a lot more actions. See that? Um, so it's nice to see that so you can kind of see... Uh, what's available for you. So there's not much our peon can do right now uh, since he's on the city tile here, but if he moves over, um, he'll he'll be able to improve. So uh, this is really important too. So I'm gonna double click on the city here. So look at the production here, right? And you usually want to improve tiles that are already being worked on by citizens. So for example, if you improve this tile here, it's not being worked by a citizen. So that's not really helping you out right now, right? So you really want to improve tiles that are already being worked on. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll probably, the first thing I'll probably do here is build a road to connect this horse. So in order for our civilization to use this horse resource, right? 
and, and to say that we have this horse resource uh, maybe even to trade later on with another civilization. We've got to build a road to it. Uh, roads also will add one commerce, right? So when you build a road, see how this is uh, just one commerce right now? This will actually be two commerce once we build the road. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move my worker over. Um, one thing you can also do too, I've kind of been kind of using the mouse. Uh, you can also use the keyboard, right? The You can use your keypad or you can use the arrow buttons on your keyboard to move around. So I, I can hit like left, for example, um, on the keypad, right? Um, and my, my unit moved over. Okay, so I still have another action. Uh, you'll see down here you can row two, which is basically if I, for example, if I do here and I row to the city, I will, I'll, this peon will connect a road to the city here, just build the roads until it connects to this point. So um, that's really valuable, uh, but we're not going to do that just yet. You definitely want to connect cities. So for example, once I get this horse um, resource, horses resource, um, I'll definitely want to connect at some point this city to this city, then this city can use the horses resource, right? And horses are a strategic resource. So uh, strategic resources and luxury resources actually as well in Tides of Crimson can be used to build certain buildings or, uh, you know, build certain units uh, will require re certain strategic resources. Um, so let's go ahead and build a road right now. So this road action is right here, right? So you see he's building that road. And hopefully that won't take too long here. All right, so our PN just built a road and uh, this will allow us access to horses, okay? So that's a beautiful thing, great. Um, another thing you'll notice, right? If you go into the city here, see how that went from one commerce to now we have two commerce in that city, or I'm sorry, on that tile. So it, it's, it just improves the value of it very quickly. Not only that, but now when I move from uh, uh, along the road, I'm only using half uh, hit points, or I'm sorry, uh, movement points. So if it costs one movement point to move from here to here, if I'm moving along a road, it's only going to cost me one half a movement point. So I, uh, that really reduces the amount of time, or I'm sorry, the amount of uh, movement points used up so I can move a lot more quickly along roads. That's another major reason. You want to build roads in your empire. Uh, we're going to go ahead and irrigate now. So uh, this is the irrigate button. Um, so a lot of flat terrain uh, in Tides of Crimson uh, can be irrigated, I guess, in Civilization Three in general. Um, so we're going to go ahead and irrigate. And when you hover over, you'll see how many turns it takes. See that? So we're going to it sounds like someone's hungry or something. I don't, I don't know. It sounds like a someone's stomach. I, I don't know what that was. <laughs> I'm sure it was an enemy unit, but I, I, I didn't catch him in time. All right. It's probably this guy, but it was this aggro. So. <laughs> Oh, this is a krog. Right? This is a krog just roaming around and see these are hostile. So he's just looks like he just took out uh, another civilization's way watcher. So these krogs are getting a little crazy. You gotta watch out for them because they will come and attack you if they attack your cities. Even if if you have no one in there, they can't actually take over your city. But if let's say you have no military units in here, they can go in and they'll steal a, a certain amount of gold from you, right? And you always want gold because uh, just real quick, uh, I don't think I've gone over this yet, but if your your gold starts to go negative, right, you'll start losing units or buildings every turn because they'll, those units or buildings require maintenance um, for the most part. So you don't want to be negative in gold. Not only that, the higher gold you have, you saw that we can trade with text, uh, a trade for text using gold, but we can also, uh, depending on your sphere type, we can also uh, hurry units or buildings, right? So like um, this is the hurry production button. Uh, 
some spheres uh, will only allow you to sacrifice population to her reproduction, which is the case right now. Um, but uh, you can also, uh, under other spheres, uh, her reproduction with gold. So that'll be at a three to one ratio in Tides of Crimson. So um, three gold will get you one shield, essentially, if you're hurting production, it's at that rate. Okay. Okay. So uh, whenever uh, one of your rivals builds a great wonder, this is what, uh, um, usually this is what this means here. This is actually a, um, a unique wonder, um, but it, it just, it's designated as a great wonder in this game, but uh, Sultan's Residence here, you can always see what it is, this link here. So uh, it looks like uh, this is what they built here. Uh, it says small wonder because the Sultan's Resident is a small wonder technically, um, but we'll, we'll get into the, some of that later here. This, this is not important right now. Okay, uh, we have our first military unit in our expansion uh, city, if you will. So remember how we queued up the pig farm? So now uh, construction on the pig farm has started already. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, fortify, right, because I want uh, this uh, military unit to guard the city. Um, I did want to go over some of these other action buttons, right? So you can also heal. So this will heal uh, usually uh, really, I think it's about like two uh, hit points per turn. Um, in the city, it really depends on where you are. For example, if you're out in this neutral territory, you might heal less. Um, in enemy territory, you cannot heal at all until you build uh, Fort Rodevarde, which is, uh, as you can see with the red dot, it's a small wonder. So if you right click on here, this allows you to heal in enemy territory. All right. So, uh, this here, pretty self-explanatory weight, just kind of pretty much just skips the turn, but your unit will be active again. Fortify, uh, we went over that, but it makes your unit inactive, right? He's just there and you won't have to give him any more commands in subsequent turns unless you activate him, right? So you can always reactivate a unit by right-clicking and then activating. So if we ever need to do that, that's that's how you'll do that. Uh, disband will actually, uh, not only destroy your unit, but it also give you uh, shields, right? So uh, if you, for example, let's say we have absolutely no use for this unit, which obviously we do right now, but if we had absolutely no use for this unit, um, you can see that this grunt is uh, cost 48 shields. So if we disband him, uh, we're actually going to get back uh, a fourth of that, right? So uh, 12 shields. So if we just disband this grunt, we can put 12 shields towards this production box, if we really wanted to, right? We're not going to do that right now, because um, I don't want to lose the city, just in case. All right, so we're going to go ahead and fortify. So you'll notice that I have another peon here, right, in construction um, in Orenai, right? Orenai is the name of my city here. Um, and, uh, in one turn, this peon will be complete. So you see how, what we mentioned earlier with the four population, um, you'll see that when this peon is produced, because he costs, if you right click here, costs one population, this population unit, uh, point total will go down. So we'll lose the ability to work one of these tiles, right? So, um. It's just the, uh, the cost of, of building uh, settlers, workers, and also this is different in Tides of Crimson, uh, higher tier units, right? Higher tier military units will also cost population points. So uh, that does not happen in the default Civ 3, but in Tides of Crimson, I, uh, usually around tier three, tier four units, um, they'll start requiring population points. So you really have to be careful about how many higher tier units you build. You can't just build you know, massive stacks, 
um, but, well, if you, you are doing that, you're, you're, you're really blowing through a lot of population and losing the ability to produce in your city. So it's always something to think about. Um, that's why uh, a balanced force in Tides of Crimson is, is, you know, it's beneficial. So you can have a bunch of units that don't, don't require population points, and then you can have some strong units that do require population points. But um, there's always that um, interesting choice that uh, you're allowed to make. All right, so uh, you'll see here, so this peon here, right, is about to get done. We have four population here right now. And notice how as soon as that peon is created, you know, we now have three population, right? It costs one population point. So we're going to go ahead and the next thing I want to do is I want to build the connection to the city. So not only will it allow me to move more quickly in between, it's going to add commerce to each tile. Um, that I'm moving to. But I also want to be smart about what tiles um, I build a road to, okay? So I'm most likely, these are really productive uh, um, tiles, right? So you see how there's extra shields with the Dico mushrooms here? So I think it's probably best because I'm going to use these tiles anyway first. Uh, like citizens are going to work these tiles first anyway because they're that they have more resources on them. So you see how working this one with the Dico and mushrooms on them. Uh, so I want to build a road along here where um, I know these tiles are going to get used. So let's go ahead and build a road here. Okay, looks like this peon has finished his work here. And now I have irrigation here. So if you double click here, see I went from two food to three food. And this means I have now three excess food and my growth, literally I was, I was growing it, you know, there was two food per turn. Now there's three food per turn. So essentially my growth in this city has increased by 50% from just that one irrigation there. So that's pretty nice. So that's the value of, of irrigating and uh, building mines uh, on certain uh, terrain will actually let you um, increase the shield production on it. So um, that's another thing that another option that you can do. And, and, and I'm sure that we'll get to that here. Um, I actually think I'll do that right here. So in general, right, if the first time you move into uh, another tile to start working on it, as, as I'm going to do here, uh, I usually like to uh, the horse, the horses are an exception because we want to connect the this, the natural, the special resource, right? But if you're not doing something like connecting a resource, uh, it's usually best to either um, mine or to uh, irrigate first, right? Because the mining or the irrigation gives you uh, shields or food, respectively, and food and shields are. Uh, much more valuable than commerce, right? Because remember, commerce is, is split into these here, uh, the gold, the science, and the happiness. So there's definitely some value to that, um, but they're not as valuable as growth or what's you know how, increasing the production in your city. So, all right, actually, I, I, and I moved to the uh, the wrong tile here. I, I wanted to move here, so don't do that. Don't don't waste turns like I do, but. Um, just for the sake of this tutorial, I want to move somewhere where we can build a mine so I can show you um, what that looks like and, and what that does to production here. So I'm going to go ahead and just move here. And again, if I'm in a, a space like this, I want to mine first. And usually you want to build a road, right? But I'll mine first and then I'll build the road second, right? Because the mine is more valuable. So uh, again, this is going to take me a little bit of time. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay, uh, looks like the road here has been completed. Uh, I wonder if I can just road to here. Yeah, that won't take the the peon off the path here. So I'm going to ask him to road to this tile here. So okay, looks like we finally discovered inundation, which is great. Um, so let's look at the big picture. Uh, certain technologies, I think inundation is, is really one of them, uh, will usually be, uh, like inundation, usually if you discover inundation first, um, 
usually the AI doesn't go for the inundation. And so what you can do is you can use this technology to turn around and trade it to, to all the other AI civilizations, right? Because they're unlikely to have a tech like this this early. So you can actually get a lot of text back just by trading this technology to them. So we're going to do that here in a second. Um, the technology recommended is Woodworks here. And again, I'm going to right click and I'm just going to see uh, what's available to me um, here. Be careful that uh, this is hard coded, so I, I, I wasn't able to change this. But you see how it says that units become available uh, from this tech, but uh, it lists uh, unique units to other races in here too. So for example, we're the orcs, right? We're not going to be able to build these because, um, well, the spearmen, I, I lied, the spearmen we can build, right? Because it's available to the orcs. But this nut trap, that's a hobbit unit, okay? So that's a hobbit unit. So we're not able to build that. So um, there's no way to really change that. Um, so uh, just, just be aware of it. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll work on Woodworks. But one thing we definitely want to do, like I was saying, is trade technologies. So we've got our pig farm, which is wonderful. Um, and this will really help with our culture. I'm going to zoom to that here real quick. So the pig farm here, right now it's built in the city. You'll see it's giving off two culture per turn. So we're getting two culture per turn here, and we're going to get up to the next level here relatively quickly. And we'll be able to expand to use all of these tiles here, um, which would be great. And then it also uh, is one content face. So what, again, what that means, this is the same face as here, right? So what that means is if there's an unhappy citizen in the city, this will make that citizen content. So now we have two. Uh, so basically, we can get up to five citizens in the city right now while keeping everybody content. Okay. All right, and pretty soon here, um, I think we saw this already, but pretty soon here, you can see that uh, this will create a pig every 50 turns. So if you click on the pig here, right, uh, it'll always tell you what, you know, what this unit is, how, what it does, uh, domesticated animal, give you a description of how to use it. Uh, I won't get too much into that, but it's, uh, you really, all you really have to do is, um, essentially have uh, there will be a, a join city button when the pig is created and as soon as that uh, you hit that join city button uh, when the pig is created um, it'll increase your population so in a sense that's kind of like slaughtering the pig uh, to get food for your for your uh, city okay all right so let's go ahead and do what we said we would with the trading. Remember, diplomacy is down here, so it's this D here. I'm just gonna hit D, and let's start with the trolls. So I bet you we're gonna be able to trade inundation to some of these, so uh, some of these AI uh, folks. So, uh, yep, you see that inundation? So what I'd like to do as well, um, and you can do this, is put inundation on the table, and um, what would you like to trade me for them? for it right so i just asked him this is a whopping i mean this is great we're gonna get two techs and 10 gold for inundation i mean this is quite a haul right <laughs> so uh i'm gonna go ahead and accept that but you see how valuable researching that one tech was as long as you get a tech that the other races don't have yet i mean you can really turn around and and catch up in technology very quickly so again we're gonna hit we would like to propose a deal again, and we're just going to cycle, use these arrows to cycle through the other civilizations. Again, we're going to see inundation here. What, what can you give me? Mathematics? Done. Done. Thank you. Um, all right. All right, so let's cycle again. Inundation. See, nobody has inundation, so we can just keep trading it away. Just 40 gold? No, I don't, I don't like that. What can, I, what can I do to... I really want one of these technologies. So, uh, let's see if he'll accept that. Oh, oops. He accepted it so quickly, I feel like I should have gotten more out of it. Uh, that sucks. Well, again, I'm a terrible player, so I didn't really uh, maximize that. But let's see who else we can trade this to. Okay, so, again, um, 
inundation. 18 gold, that's a terrible deal. Let's see if he'll trade two technologies to me for this. Uh, I guess he won't. How much gold do I have? Lump sum. Again, if I hit lump sum, I should be able to... Oh, it's not giving me the option here. Okay, so this should automatically, hopefully here, if I take this off and just hit lump sum, should automatically give me the amount here to trade. Um, but it's not doing that. That's really odd to me. Um, I don't know if that's a bug or not. Uh, okay, inundation and ballistics. I feel like I should be getting more. Let's see how much he'll give me. Let's see if he'll uh, give me some gold with that. Oh, he doesn't have that much gold. This list is gold right there, so that's just me not reading. Okay, okay, okay. Whatever. I'll take that one technology. That was a lot of work for no reason, so don't do what I did. <laughs> a lot of these video, this video here is uh, showing you what not to do by doing the things that I do. So, um, all right, so we're going through, oh, look, the Dark Elves don't have ballistics. Should like to trade something for that four gold? You gotta be kidding me. That's all they have? No, that's not, I, I'm sorry, that's not worth it. Um, all right, I think I'm done. So you see how better, if I go back to my tech tree here, right? See how much more filled out, see the blue here? My tech tree is just from that trading just because I happened to research a technology that no one else had. So if you, you're you really good in teching or you, you get really fast, uh, you can reach certain techs first and then you can just start trading them away. So it's, it's a nice strategy here. Um, I think I wanna go for this here, uh, Orcish Honor now. Um, just bear in mind when you're going for these uh, race specific techs, just remember that uh, this will put you behind in the tech race slightly, right? Because all these other techs are uh, technologies or are, are things that every race can research, right? But every race cannot research this. Only the orcs can do this. So when you research this, other other civilizations, yeah, they might be researching their own unique techs. But if they're not, then they're they're going to be getting an extra tech over here while you're researching this. So it's kind of the trade off of, of some of these unique techs. Um, one thing I did want to point out to you, you see these little uh, like unavailable uh, markers. So this just means that this technology is not required for era advancement, right? So anytime you see one of these, is it's not required to get to the next era. See if you click this button here, you go to the next era, which is the alchemy era. See all these new texts and stuff. But so basically what this is saying is, that, and again, unique, unique, uh, texts are never uh, required, but all you got to do is research all the texts that don't have this, right? So I got to research this stuff, and then I can go for these texts here, and then I can go into the next era, okay? All right, let's just keep on going here. Our society is starting to look a little bit better. It looks like I must have a road. Uh, from city to city, that's a great thing. So what I'm doing here is uh, definitely not optimal. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing it more, uh, well, uh, because it's a tutorial, right? Number one, so I, I wanna show you different things, but number two, because I'm, I'm just not a very good player, so I, I don't do anything else optimal either. But really your focus at the beginning of the game should really be uh, getting settlers out as much as possible, settler units to to go and build cities, right? Because city, cities are so valuable. Look at all this free land here. So once you, you it's like a land grab race, right? So once you grab this land, no one else can have it unless they take it from you by force. And But the same thing for the AI, right? If they start expanding into some of this territory here, they're gonna get some valuable cities that we're not gonna be able to have. So 
um, really you should, uh, when you can and you can afford it uh, population wise as well, um, you should try to build some settlers. So we're going to go ahead and build some a settler here. Um, and here, now uh, we're still building a grunt. Um, we're going to switch to, uh, real quick here, I, I'm, now that I'm looking at it here, I just want to go over this real quick. Uh, so you'll see how anything underneath the wealth line, so wealth, this is just basically an idle state for your uh, city, right? So anytime you don't want to produce anything, you just hit this wealth button, um, you'll actually lose the shields as well. So whatever you're producing here. Um, that's fine. This is a this is a tutorial. I just want to show you what it looks like. Um, okay, so this is wealth, and you'll actually produce uh, gold here at a uh, uh, I'm sorry, you, yeah, at a four to one uh, ratio based on your shields. So, for example, for every uh, four shields you have, it'll turn into one gold. Okay, if you're a race like the Breton, the Bretons. Right, so it says it right here. If you right click, right, so you'll get a four to one ratio. This is cut in half if you're a, a different race, right? The Bretons here. So, but everyone else, four to one ratio. So basically, just means you don't want to build anything, you don't want to control anything, you just don't want, but you don't want the city to keep pumping out units or buildings that will cost you maintenance uh, later on. So uh, anything underneath this wealth line is going to be um, either a small or a great wonder, right? So um, you'll see here anything underneath the wealth line, anything without the red dot is a great wonder, okay? Anything with a red dot is a small wonder. So that's how you'll quickly be able to differentiate. So some of these, uh, uh, man, those, those orcs, <laughs> uh, that, that kind of threw me off. I wonder what, I mean, that's, I wonder what, where they get those, those languages from. It's pretty, pretty brilliant. Um, all right, so I can right click on this, for example, the Cle Clefestian Mounds. This will say it's a great wonder. Um, this right here, I'll go over this real quick. Uh, great wonders, again, are buildings that can only be built once by any civilization. So if, if we build the Clefestian Mounds, no one else can build this, right? So it's it's really valuable. Uh, obviously, the cost in shields is very high, as you can see. Um, so it takes a long time to build. But um, okay, so if you go the Golden Age traits, this is something that uh, pretty much all great wonders have, right? This is just basically the traits that this great wonder has, and if the traits that this great wonder has align with your civilizations or your races traits uh, and uh, you you do two of them right you hit two of the traits you can actually get a, a golden age so a golden age is is basically a period of time where you get uh, a bunch of extra uh, production and, and commerce so yeah you you really want that um, sometimes you may not want it too early but that's that's really depending on your your strategy. Um, so let me just show you here. So if we look at our own, um, our own race, right, essentially, so we've got a races, uh, orcs. The orcs are, if you look at the strengths, right, here. The orcs are militaristic and religious, right? So uh, each strength essentially gives different bonuses, and, and we won't go through all of them here, but they're listed here for, for you to read. But because the orcs are militaristic and religious, right, if they go ahead and um, build a great wonder, that is militaristic and religious, they can get a golden age, right? So let's say Hope's Temple, right? So golden age traits religious, right? So that knocks off one of our traits, okay? So the orcs are uh, militaristic and religious. If we build Hope's Temple, we knock out that religious trait. And so all we need is to build another great wonder with the militaristic trait 
and then we'll get a golden age. Okay, so golden age is, is just 15 turns of uh, where any uh, tile that's already producing one shield gets an extra shield, and any tile already producing one commerce gets an ex extra commerce. So it's a huge, huge boost for those 15 turns. Um, all right. So just wanted to show you that. Um, I don't know if I want to work on these because I feel like uh, this this will take way too long. And, and for the talk. purpose of uh, this tutorial, it, it's it's going to be a really long time. So <laughs> um, we're going to build something else. Like the builder that I just talked about. Okay. All right. So I've got another grunt here. Uh, I've got two uh, two in garrison here. So this is just one of those two. Um, and I'm, I really want to know what's around me. So I, I, I'm going to walk, maybe walk him around. Another option you have, right, is to hit this explore button and your unit will automatically explore. Um, so actually we can, we can do that right now just to show you what that looks like here. See how quickly he moved because he was along those roads. Um, so he ended up moving four spaces here. Um, you'll also notice that at the end of the turn, as long as you have like a fraction of a movement point, you can actually move on to any terrain. So you see how like the forests, you know, take uh, more movement costs here. So I can show you um, again, terrain, forest, right? The movement cost is two. So it, it costs two movement to move uh, onto a, a forest tile. But as long as this, this orc at this time, right, he only had a fraction of a movement point, but because it was his very last move, he was able to move onto the forest. So your, your very last move, as long as you have a, at least a fraction of a movement point, you can move onto pretty much any tile, but then you, your, your turn will be done after that. So uh, keep that in mind when you're, you're kind of moving units around. All right, our peon is done building the road here. You'll notice that uh, there's a Krog up here. So if he gets anywhere near uh, the peon here, uh, we might be in trouble, we might not. Luckily for the orcs, uh, again, uh, the peon has uh, four defense, which is really good for a uh, worker unit. Uh, most worker units do not have much defense, if any. So we can still kind of defend ourselves here, but we, we still don't want to get, I, I really don't want to get attacked by a Krog just in case. Um, but I do want to use this, um, this peon here to, I'm, I'm thinking this would be a good city site over here. So um, eventually if we want to have this as a city site, eventually we're going to need a road to it. So maybe I'm going to start on that right now and also build a connection to, to this resource here, which is the uh, Agati crystals. Um, so uh, go ahead and... Yeah, I think I'm just gonna move here and we'll start on that road, okay? All right, so this peon has built a mine. Right click and do terrain info. You can kind of see the underlying terrain because um, I know the, the unit right now is covering it up. But there's a mine now, so uh, now there's extra shields. You see that, that production there just bumped up. Um, because of that mine, okay? Uh, again, you want to mine, for the most part, you want to mine and irrigate before you build your road. So we've already mined here. We're going to go ahead and build the road now. Um, don't really like to leave a tile without building a road, just because if you ever have to go back to that tile, then it costs more movement points, right? So before you leave a tile with a worker unit, um, I would I mean, almost all cases build a road there. So there's probably exceptions, but um, yeah, that's the general strategy. You want you want to build roads and anytime you're you're on a tile um, before you leave it. All right. Looks like our um, grunt here is really opening up some some visibility to us here. It's, it's spotting a crog over here. Um, looks like there's a city over here, uh, Lizardman City. Okay, interesting. 
wonder if there's a piece of land there. I don't think they're able to build on water here. So uh, only the Naga really can build cities out of water. Um, so uh, I think there's just a chunk of land here. All right. Um, one thing I want to do just, just to show you uh, what it, what it is, is uh, plant a forest, right? So if you see flat terrain like this, notice how um, here this is flat terrain. Production is, you know, you're more focused on food. Um, but if you want to get some of this blue, these shields, right, uh, it's probably a good idea to build if, if your uh, city is lacking in production, right? then you can plant a forest and that really helps a lot. So let me just plant a forest here just to show you um, the, the production um, boost that that gives. And again, that would be analogous to a lot of these other forests here, right? See how that's one food, two shields. So that's pretty much what we're hoping for. Um, I'm going to reset this. Okay. All right. There's a crog underneath me. So when your units are set to automatically do something, such as explore or build a road to somewhere, if they run into something hostile, right? So for example, this this crog right here, they're gonna stop and you, they're gonna make. Uh, basically, the game makes you give them the, give the unit a command because now a decision has to be made, right? There's something hostile nearby. So I'm actually going to, this is flat land, unlike the last time I attacked a Krog, right? Um, so the defense is four, okay? I think I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just attack here because my my offense with the grunt and the extra hit point is, I'm, I'm pretty good. The grunts are, are really good units early on. So see how this, the attack is six here. So a six into four, um, if I didn't explain this earlier, so. Uh, six attack, four defense, right? Six plus four is 10. So that's the total, right? So basically we have a uh, six divided by 10 chance. So a 60% chance of winning uh, each individual kind of uh, battle with this Krog. So I think we've got a really good chance here. We're gonna just go ahead and attack them. Um, uh, another thing that you'll find too is that uh, this is this is basically uh, called a uh, focus attack. So some units have the focus attack ability. The orc grunts have the focus attack ability against Krog units. Um, so that's pretty neat. So they, for example, it doesn't matter too much here because we have got two full health troglos. But for example, let's say that one of these troglos was low in health, right? We could focus our energies on that troglo instead of uh, the other uh, Troglo with higher health and, and try to get rid and make sure that we kill the, the, the weakened Troglo. Okay, so um, if there's multiple units in a stack, uh, the unit that defends is always going to be kind of the highest defend defensive, uh, you know, efficiency unit. So it could be the unit with the highest uh, defense value, but if that, you know, a unit with a high defense value gets really low in hit points, then another unit's going to start defending um, when you start attacking the stack. So it's always that the highest defensive efficiency unit that, that kind of takes over and defends. But when you focus attack, you can kind of choose. So that's that's kind of the value of focus attacks. Um, when you get into, this is Tides of Crimson specific, when you get into uh, elemental units, because there'll be elements like fire, ice, uh, wind, things like that, uh, you'll actually be able to create mismatches with elements to to create focus attacks, which is can be really valuable. All right, so let's attack. Here. Oh, that was close. <laughs> I almost died. Um, that was a little dangerous. So what I can do here, right, see how vulnerable my unit here is in open space. Uh, you don't get any defensive bonus for flat terrain, essentially, right? Uh, but if I move into this forest or in these mountains here, I get a defense bonus. So now that my unit is low in health, um, I think I want to get away and I, I definitely want a chance to heal, but I also want to be in safe uh, territory. So I'll go ahead and move him into this forest here. Um, 
Oh, it's safer. Oh, I got attacked anyway. Um, okay, that's great. I did forget about the one rule with, uh, this is kind of a, a cheat uh, that, uh, there's a really uh, a popular uh, streamer called S Suede. On, uh, he just does a lot of Civ 3 stuff. And he actually, uh, lit, you know, just watching his, his videos, I was able to find out that uh, Krogs, so barbarians in general, will attack along certain axes. So like, for example, they'll attack uh, um, here. This would be a northwest or southeast, right? And I move right into that. So a lot of the, the Krogs won't attack in other directions. So I just made a mistake I wasn't thinking. And um, I tried to be safe. I tried to move into the forest to be safe, but I actually ended up getting attacked. So um, bad move. Uh, again, if you want to survive in uh, Tides of Crimson, just don't play like I do, and, and you'll be fine. All right. I did also want to take this opportunity to, to show you um, the, the new players here, the advisor screen. So we haven't really gone through much of this because I, I wanted to focus on more of the gameplay. Um, but if you hit the advisor screen, right, we've gone through the tech tree, but there's also a lot uh, else here. Okay, the domestic advisor, uh, if you click on it, will kind of give you a good breakdown of your economy, right? So, you know, how much is coming in as far as income, how much is going out, right? What your treasury is currently and how much you're making every turn, right? Uh, what sphere you're at, if you click this, actually, if you have a sphere available, you'll be able to uh, change your sphere here. Um, so here's where you can change the percent of commerce that goes to science or luxuries. Um, any amount that isn't allocated here, right, will go to your treasury. So it'll basically be uh, tax income. So for example, if I put this all the way down, right, you see how my net gain is increasing. So that's how the three aspects of commerce work together here, right? So here's the gold. Here's the science. If I increase science, that's that increases just my my beaker production, right? And I can increase happiness here, uh, luxuries. So, all right. So it's always good to kind of balance that. You can play around that with that and, and see your net gain if if you want to, you know, maximize your potential income as well. Um, down here is just city information. It's great uh, to kind of look at this. Um, it's sortable as well, as you can see. So that's really nice. Um, you can kind of see kind of citizens you have. Again, here's an unhappy citizen in red. Um, so that's really obvious. You'll see this on the city screen as well. Um, and then what the cities are producing. So this is a really valuable screen um, to be looking at. Uh, the next one is a trade here. And this just is, you know, this shows you what resources you have locally um, and Import just means trading uh, with others that, you know, resources that you don't have that you're getting from other civilizations. And this would be, uh, you know, resources that you are actually trading out. Okay. So some pretty self-explanatory stuff here. You can see like cities that are connected. And if they're not connected, again, remember the connections are by roads. So if you build a road to a city, it becomes connected. Um, here's your military advisor. This one I like a lot. Um, just because it gives you, uh, you know, your total amount of units, how many units are allowed, right? Uh, this is based a lot on your sphere too, um, but the more cities you have, obviously this unit will go up. This is basically your allotment of units that you can, uh, units you can have for free, essentially, right? So when this goes up to 10, you'll, you'll hit your maximum. If you have 11 total units, for example, you're gonna start paying an army support cost, okay? So in Tides of Crimson, the default for most spheres is two gold per turn for any unit that is over the allowed units. So you really want to be careful uh, on that because you can really start getting penalized pretty heavily if your army's uh, too big, uh, way more than you can support. Okay. All right. So here is the foreign advisor. So this is uh, really valuable to see what kind of... Uh, basically relationships you have with other civilizations. Uh, if you click on an AI civ or an enemy civ, uh, you can see what their relations are. For example, if I can click on here uh, with you, 
Okay. So here, this is just peace. So you can see peace here. If I was at war, uh, this would be red. Okay, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, cultural advisor uh, that just lets you know how your cities are growing, what culture level you're at, right? Remember uh, that our uh, capital city, Orani, right, has a, you know, a, a decent culture rating uh, because we started there, but uh, Look how fast this culture grew in our second city, and that's because of our uh, pig farm here. Just there's just a lot of culture being produced there. Um, so yeah, this is this is a great page anytime you want to kind of look at a, a quick summary of uh, your civilization. I think we're going to stop it here for now. Um, I will be creating uh, more videos. If, if you're watching this right upon release, I will be creating more videos within the next few days. I'm just I'm just starting a string of videos now because I, I haven't for a while. And I know that there have been a couple people who've uh, asked about uh, these kinds of guides uh, just so uh, they can kind of get in the swing of, of Tides of Crimson. So I know that there's there's a lot of changes from uh, Civ 3, for example. So those videos just showing the changes from default Civ 3 will also be coming in the future. So please look out for those. Uh, again, like and subscribe. Uh, it helps. and. Uh, kind of lets you know uh, when uh, a new video is released. So it's, it's nice to keep track of things as well. All right, see you next time.